Hi, I'm Fabian Mülberg and I'm presenting joint work with Tom Hensinger at ISK Austria, which is our vision for differential monitoring. In a nutshell, differential monitoring is the idea of running two or more versions of the same program side by side, providing them with the same inputs and checking whether they produce equivalent outputs. This is a reasonably simple idea and we believe that it will make an interesting addition to the runtime verification toolbox. As we discuss differential monitoring, it helps keeping the following goals in mind. First, we want to use easily accessible resources to improve software reliability. What we mean by that is that we want to use things like additional processor cores or memory, or additional code written in standard languages. Either of those may already be present in the form of underutilized hardware or existing, say, former versions of some code, but they might also be easy to additionally provision, such as by buying new hardware or writing new code. The tagline for this goal could also be called increasing software safety through over-engineering in the good sense of the word. Now, the software we want to improve needs to be tied together with these new parts with easy to use monitoring facilities. These monitoring facilities should be black box. They should be unintrusive in the sense that they incur low overhead. They should run in real time uh, next to the monitored software. And if there are any specifications necessary, those should be reasonably high level and not depend on the technical specifics of the implemented programs. Now, black box monitoring makes sense in a lot of scenarios. For one thing, there might be intellectual property issues where you don't even have access to the source code of the program you're trying to verify. But even when you do, the code might be way too complex in order to be able to verify it within reasonable resources. The code may also stem from an untrusted vendor who may have adversarially tried to hide certain weaknesses from you. Finally, the code may be subject to frequent updates. So even if you can reason about it and verify it right now, all of this might be moved a week from now. So with black box monitoring, all we care about are the inputs and outputs to the program and the relationships between them. What's nice about that is that we're already doing end-to-end -end verification. Let's look at an example of this. Say we are trying to verify a bank uh, as a black box model. Now, from the outside, we can see some interactions of the bank with its environment. People might make money transfers, uh, ask for the, check, for the balance of their bank accounts, they might create new accounts or delete them. And the bank might send out alerts if the balance of an account goes below a certain threshold, for example. Now, what should be the output in response to a balance check request? Uh, on the face of it, this is relatively simple. Right? The balance of an account should be the sum of all money transfers into it minus the sum of all the money transfers out of it. But there's actually more going on, even though we already have to keep track of a lot of things from the outside, because there are also internal operations to the bank. For example, it might add interest at certain intervals, it might deduct fees from the account, and there might also be some automated internal transfers that might have either been scheduled by the user or be things like rounding up your checking transactions and transferring the difference to your savings account. All of this can be modeled in a black box model, but what it comes down to is that when we write a black box model of this whole program, we essentially wrote the program a second time. Therefore, differential monitoring asks, instead of writing a full formal specification for these complex inner workings, why not just write a second program in a regular programming language? This gets us to the setup that I briefly summarized at the beginning of this talk. We have two or more programs. One of them might be seen as the original one, though it doesn't really matter. And the others may have been written by different teams, different vendors, maybe in different languages. Both of them communicate with their environment and the monitor sits exactly between these programs and the environment, duplicating any inputs that come from the environment and intercepting any outputs coming from the programs, checking them for equivalence and merging them before sending them off to the environment. Now, you might have thought this at the beginning, or you may be thinking it just now. This might sound familiar to you. And in fact, the idea is relatively old. In the 1970s, Avicenes and others published a line of work called N-version programming. And now N-version programming 
is a little bit more of a gray box approach compared to ours because the programs have to explicitly communicate with the monitor, sending it part of their state in a specified format at specified synchronization points so that the monitor can compare them and make sure that each program is still on track. This line of work eventually got bogged down in an argument over whether the mistakes that programmers make when writing similar code are actually independent of each other and what that means for any sorts of guarantees that n version programming was supposed to make. Therefore, the main conceptual successor to n version programming, called n version execution, abandons the idea of having programmers write the different versions and instead opts for systematic changes to some initial version of the program. The downside of this is that we can only find errors that are exposed by specifically these changes. For example, one might expose memory errors like buffer overflows by changing the direction in which the stack grows or the memory layout of one's data structures. The upside of it is that we can expect all these programs to, ex to have very similar patterns in how they interact with their environments. And so black box implementations can rely on these similarities in trying to ensure equivalence, which makes the program easier, though not completely trivial. Now, differential monitoring takes part of its name from yet another line of work, which is called differential testing. And as the name suggests, testing is an offline affair, so we don't have any real life data to input into our programs. Therefore, a big focus of this kind of work is test input generation to cover lots of different cases. This has proven very successful for finding bugs in compilers and SQL databases. And as such, differential testing demonstrates that whether or not programmers' errors are truly independent when they write different programs, interesting bugs can be found in practice. And so at least as a best effort monitoring technique, differential monitoring will be able to ensure the absence of some interesting errors or show them to the users, thus improving software quality. So in summary, differential monitoring is differential testing applied to actual live running programs in a monitoring setting and kind of combines ideas from all of these fields and runtime verification. Differential monitoring does come with challenges that we believe are interesting to the runtime verification community. The first of these is isolation. The key issue here is that we want to keep up the illusion to both the environment and the programs that there is only one instance of the program running, not several. So each program thinks of itself as directly interacting with the environment. The problem is that a program might expect to see the effects of some of its outputs in its inputs again. So there will be instances that we have to handle where one program has produced some output and the other one hasn't. Consider the case where we simply forward the output of some program to the environment and only check afterwards whether any future outputs by the other programs match those first outputs. In that case, all programs could see the effects of that output in their inputs even those that have not yet produced that output, and that might justifiably confuse them a little bit. So what if instead we don't forward the output to the environment immediately, but rather wait until all programs have produced a matching output? If we let the programs that have produced an output continue with their work in the meantime, then they might wonder where the effects are that they are now expecting to see in their input. So we either have to stop their execution for a while until we find the matching outputs, which may lead to deadlocks, or we have to emulate the changes to the environment somehow in the inputs to specifically those programs, which is not generally possible. Another challenge is non-determinism, which is often an issue for verification, but generally accepted in certain forms in practical programs. For example, we might have a server that hands out claims to identifiers. A client might ask the server for a claim to a particular identifier, at which point the server checks whether that identifier has already been allocated, and if not, allocates it to the client and sends a positive response to the client. Now a second client might come along and try to claim the same identifier, at which point the server notices that the identifier has already been allocated 
and sends a negative response to the client. Now it might be that the two requests come in at roughly the same time. And here we often accept some non-determinism in which client actually gets the identifier allocated and which client loses out. So what you could easily see is that if there are two server programs who might parallelize the handling of requests and different threads, then simple scheduling might mean that different clients get allocated the claim in the two different processes, leading different answers that are sent to those clients in response, and also different internal states of the servers that might affect future answers to requests. A simple form of non-determinism that neither affects the future state of the server nor the logical content of its answer to the client are timestamps. A server might attach timestamps to some of its answers to give the client an idea of when this answer was valid. Now it's easy to see that two different processes might query the system clock at different times and therefore produce slightly different answers with slightly different timestamps. However, it's also easy to imagine a monitor specification that tells the monitor to ignore differences in, in timestamps, or at least treat timestamps that are close enough together as equivalent. Going back to a higher level, one thing that's interesting about non-determinism and isolation is that in some cases we can trade them off against each other, simply by deciding what goes into the black box. Each program may, for example, store its data in its own database instance, or in its own parts of the file system, or communicate with its own web service. We can treat all of these as part of the black box. And that's good for isolation and monitoring overhead because there's nothing that we have to check about the program's interactions with any of these resources. As a downside, we have to use additional memory for all this duplicate data, and we cannot share any of these resources with programs outside of the black boxes because they cannot be aware of their mirrored nature. So instead, we might want to move any or all of these resources into the environment. Now, when we do that, the resources are shared between the monitored programs and can also be shared with programs outside of the monitored setup. The downside is that we now have to monitor all interactions of the monitored programs with the resources. And that means we need to worry about isolation. On the other hand, we can exploit this to deal with non-determinism in some cases. For example, in our scenario where we need to allocate identifiers to clients, we can use a transactional database to store the associations between clients and identifiers and use the transactions to push the non-determinism into the database and enforce synchronization among the monitored programs. The higher level point here is that differential monitoring focuses any formal effort on wherever two or more versions of the same program may differ, be that in the demands for isolation or in handling non-determinism. Incorporating the most standard scenarios here into a simple specification language for differential monitoring will be an interesting avenue for future work. Now, actually implementing a differential monitor comes with its own set of technical challenges which are related to the goals stated in the beginning of this talk. First, we want the monitor to be unintrusive, that is, it should run in real time next to the monitored program and incur low overhead. And second, we only want user level specifications for those cases where the monitored variants might differ in their behavior, which is different from what the monitor will actually observe in terms of their interactions with the environment. In particular, there is equivalence reasoning that needs to be done on these interactions because they cannot necessarily be mapped one-to-one -one between the individual programs. For example, one program might write a big file in one swoop, while another program might write the same data to the same file in lots of smaller writes, both of which are equivalent, but that needs to be recognized by the monitor. All of this needs to be done efficiently while also avoiding deadlocks due to trying to ensure isolation. In order to establish some baseline expectations of how efficient differential monitoring can be, we ran some experiments. In particular, on what we view as the most common case where two programs produce equal outputs. So here's our experimental setup. 
we're trying to measure the monitoring overhead for programs who produce perfectly equal output. We modified a Linux kernel to offer a special variant of the fork system call that signals that the resulting processes should be differentially monitored. The differential monitor then intercepts all system calls that relate to input and output, opening files, closing files, reading and writing. When a process writes, by default we stop it until we get a matching write from the other process, and then both processes can continue and we submit the write to the actual environment. Now we wrote benchmark programs in several different languages, C, Python and Java, and also varied somewhat between the algorithms and inputs that these programs get. We then measure all pairings of these benchmark programs and take the overhead with respect to the longer running single program, which is a reasonable baseline for how long it would take to run those programs side by side. Because none of our benchmark programs actually expect to see the effects of any of their outputs in their inputs, we also implemented an optimal, optional optimization that immediately returns on writes instead of stopping the programs, therefore sacrificing some isolation guarantees. We also show the numbers for this optimization. Now I will discuss one of our benchmarks in detail. You can find the others and their results in our paper and technical report. Now, as the name suggests, the PRIMES benchmark is centered around primality tests and prime enumeration. We use two different algorithms. The sieve of Eratosthenes is implemented in all three languages, C, Java, and Python, and the Bailey PSW algorithm is just implemented in Java. We use two different versions. One is interactive and accepts a sequence of queries for primeness of some number n or the nth prime in, on the standard input. We run this twice, one with larger queries, but fewer of them, and one with smaller queries, but more of them. We also have a non-interactive version, which simply enumerates the first 10,000 primes. They were being a lot more output and computation heavy. So let's look at the results. For the interactive benchmarks, we ran the C version of the CIF of Eratosthenes against the Java version of Bailey PSW. As you can see in the middle columns, the running times for just running the single program are relatively close together. In the third to last column, also colored in orange, you can see the overheads of running the various combinations in a different from monitoring setup. In the last column, also colored in green, you can see the same overheads under the optimization that doesn't stop programs when they're trying to run. Overall, the overheads are relatively low in all cases. The optimization gives us some benefit for the larger queries where some computational work is installed by waiting for a write to finish. For the non-interactive benchmarks, we measured more different versions. In particular, both the Java versions for Bailey PSW and for the SIF of Eratosthenes, here called Java E. The latter version is particularly fast, but also incurs the biggest overheads for differential monitoring. We believe that this is because of the runtime optimization behavior of the Java Virtual Machine, which can optimize this particular algorithm pretty well, but also reacts poorly to having a second program run side by side, even without monitoring at all. With that in mind, the overheads are still pretty low and can be further brought down in most cases by our optimization. Across all our benchmarks, the maximum overhead we encountered was 150%, and with the optimization in a different configuration, 64%. However, both of these again showed anomalies due to the Java Virtual Machine's runtime optimization behavior. Based on these numbers, we believe that practical differential monitoring is in the realm of the plausible. In summary, differential monitoring is a lightweight, black box, end-to-end -end runtime verification technique that turns the traditional formal specification effort on its head by requiring at most a specification of where actual programs may differ. As such, it provides a relatively simple way to increase program safety through over-engineering. In order to make it a reality, some challenges remain. In particular, guaranteeing isolation, dealing with non-determinism, and all the while staying efficient. We believe that these challenges can be overcome, which would add a simple yet powerful technique to the runtime verification toolbox.
thanks for watching.